Speaking into your ear, whispering you again one more time, right? So, yeah. Or screaming. <laughs> so, I think most of the time we go to church on Sunday, we don't really hear what the scriptures actually say. We hear yeah. a, a, a version of what the world says, but yes. we slap the, the sticker of God on it. Mm -hmm. And because somebody opened the Bible and ran, read the carnal mind out of the Bible, we think we heard the Bible. But we had to, we heard the carnal mind all over. Yes. Right? So yeah. we, we never did get anything. Right, right, right. We just got more of what the world is telling. Yeah, which is the basis of my comment before yeah. hearing your message on Sunday. Yeah. This is I would have, I would have struggled because I I would have explained it carnal. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Greg, can you explain to us for, for some of us that might not know how to verbalize? How would you describe what it means to read the Bible carnally, as opposed to reading the Bible spiritually? The the Bible contains the truth. In it, that when heard and um, believed and walked in, will give birth to life in you, free from your self effort. Free from your self effort. So it talks about a truth that when that truth can dwell in your heart, that truth will be a tree of life in you. That truth will bring forth fruit. Right? So that would be reading from the, the mind of Christ. Reading from the carnal mind or the mind of Adam is I read the Bible and I pick out things that the Bible tells me to do in order to bring forth. All right? That would be reading from the carnal mind. So you go to church, you hear about how you need to clean up your sin. You, you hear about how you need to do these things. You hear about how you need to bring forth this fruit, that fruit. You need to keep yourself from doing these bad things. You got to perform. That's the carnal mind. Right? That's, that's the mind of Adam. That's what Adam was busy with. After he ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? And so the mind of Christ would be that you come in and hear the work that God has done. And through the course of hearing about the work that God has done, his work will influence your heart unto rest. And as you rest in the work that he's done, his life manifests out of you or it's born inside of you, right? To the degree that after it's born inside of you, you can only look back and say, I don't really know how that happened, Lord. Or not. Right? It's like the parable of the sower sowing the seed. The guy went to bed day and night, day and night, never saw any fruit. And one day he woke up and he had a whole crop, yet he knew not how it got there. Right? And so that's how you know you're here in the spirit. If you're hearing in church about how you're going to bring forth the crop and how you're going to do this and do that, then that's not, that's not hearing the word. Right? That's hearing a word, but it's not the word. And so that, that's a big difference. If, if that makes any sense, right? And the thing we're trying to touch on is, I don't think we understand it, but unless we think, unless we can look at ourselves, how do I want to say this? None of us think that God lives by external commandments. Does any of us think that you have to tell God how to love? Do any of us think we have to tell God he should love? Do we think that it's because God sees something written on the wall that says he should love, that that's why he loves. Is it because God looks and says, well, you know, the good and the right thing to do is to love, therefore I'm going to love. Okay, if we can't say that's how love comes out of God, then neither can we say that's how it comes out of us. Okay? And so what we want to ask ourselves and ask God, if we don't understand this yet, how does love manifest out of you, God? What is it that's in you? What is it that's about you? What is it that is where love is just coming out of you all the time? How is it that that happens? How is it that you get that right? Okay? And then you can start seeing that's how it's going to happen inside of me. So unless you think God's got a list of things up in heaven that said, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not destroy, and that's how he finds the power to not steal, kill, and destroy, then that's not, not how we're going to see it happen inside of us. Right? And so what, what, I, when I, what I got into towards the end of the message, what I was hoping people would see is that God's life 
is what gives birth to peace and love and joy. Eternal life is what gives birth to peace and love and joy, right? His life is so much, it's so full, it's not subject to decay, it's not subject to corruption, it can't be taken from, it can't be added to, it can't be stolen from, it can't be hurt. His life is so much that, man, peace and love and joy come out of it. You know what I'm saying? And so at the end of the day, God wants us to be filled with the fruit of his life. What he comes to do is give birth to eternal life in us. To where when we think about our life, our thoughts are so full of beauty and glory that we feel love. We feel peace. We feel joy. We feel kindness and meekness and patience and, and all those kinds of things. Right? And so that's how life is born in us. And I think what we've tried to do, human beings, is we've tried to look at God's life externally and the fruit of his life. And so we see God loves. We see God's full of peace and joy. We see that he's kind. We see that he doesn't steal, kill, or destroy. And then we think we're going to mimic that. We're going to look at it, and then we're going to use our ability to mimic it or to bring it forth. Right? That's what it would mean to live by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's what Adam tried to do. Okay? So... A whole lot of people agree that it's good to love. Adam agreed it was good to love when he was standing there naked. And then when he tried to bring forth love or to clothe himself by his ability to bring forth love, he found himself naked and ashamed. Okay? So, yes, it's good to love, but the question is, how are we going to find love manifesting out of us? How are we going to find love born inside of us? Right? That's the question we want to answer. And I think for many Christians... They don't really understand how that works. I think many Christians don't understand what brings forth the fruit of the Spirit and what brings forth the works of the flesh. I mean, the moment you have a guy come and say, love is a choice, then you know they don't understand anything about what love is or how love is born in a person. Love is not a choice. You don't choose to love, right? Love is something that manifests out of you. In the day you say, i got to choose to love, you're living by self-effort. And that's not really love at all. That's not really love at all. I'm just going to call it what it is. That's selfishness. And it's limited in spite of something else. It's yeah. not because you love, right. it's because you're being required to love. That's right. That's right. Which is actually selfishness, because you're worried about your own life. Right. right. Yeah. If you're thinking of your own life first, <laughs> or, which would be what you're doing if you're thinking this is the right thing to do, I'm supposed to do it. You're thinking of your own life. Love can't be born from that foundation. Right. right? Yeah. And so I think the churches have gotten really confused about what gives birth to the fruit of the Spirit and what gives birth to the work of the flesh. Right? So we talked about the new man and, and differentiated between who the old man is and who the new man. We tend to define the old man and the new man by the fruit that manifests in them, yes. which is corrupt to do it that way. Yes. That's not how you define the new man and the old man. You define the new man and the old man by the life that they possess. So the old man is the man who was clothed in death. He was dying. Okay? He was dead. He was perishing. His flesh was corrupting. He was decaying. His life was subject to sin and death. Right? The new man is the man that's clothed in eternal life or immortality or whose life is not subject to sin and death. It's not subject to the world. It's not subject to corruption or decay or moth or rust. That's why Jesus come and told the, the Pharisees, he said that you can't worship God and man. Right? And then he said that if your treasure is in heaven, then how great will the light that's in, be in, that's in you? Right? Yes. But if your treasure is in the earth, then how great will that darkness be? Right? Yes. He's talking about your life. So if when you're busy judging your life or considering it or weighing it in the balance, if you're busy considering the light you have from the world, then you're dwelling in darkness. And you're identifying with a corruptible life. That corruptible life will bring stress and torment and fear to your heart. Right? And that will bring forth the fruit of death in you. Backbiting, envy, gossiping, hatred, stealing, lying, all those kinds of things. Right? But if your treasure is in heaven, if when you weigh your life in the balance, if when you judge your life, you're looking at the very life of God, and you see yourself in his face, and you see your life having been hid in him, and you see the substance of what your life is made up of, 
It's not made up of what you see in your flesh here or what you see in the world around you or in the good fruit that you can bring forth or the bad fruit you can keep from coming forth. But you see the substance of what your life is made up of is the very life of the Godhead. That will fill your heart with rest. It will bring forth rest inside of you. It will fill your heart with the love of God. And the love of God is not just God loves you, although he loves you. And that's part of the love of God. The love of God is that when your heart gets animated with the fact that his life is your life, then all the fruit of his spirit manifests on the inside of you. And you feel peace and love and joy. And it ain't because you brought it forth. If it's because you brought it forth, then you're fathering your own life. And if you're fathering your life, then God can't be fathering your life. And God doesn't father your life by coming and telling you, do you see what my life looks like? Now go and do it. That's not how he fathers your life. He fathers your life by implanting the incor his incorruptible seed into your heart. And then that seed starts taking roots into your heart. And then it starts, after it takes roots and gets established, it comes out with a big tree full of life. Right? And that's how it comes from. I know when I was in uh, college, I had a roommate. We had these funny little magnets on the uh, refrigerator, and it was two people. And we had all these different clothes, outfits, shoes, hats, sunglasses, all these different things you could put on the magnet. Well, sometimes, man, I go look at the magnet. My roommate put, you know, stuff on the magnet, and I just didn't like it. I didn't feel it. When I looked at what that person was clothed in, on the refrigerator, it didn't make me feel nice inside. I felt like something's wrong with it. This isn't right, you know? It, it made me feel just like, what is, this is icky, yeah. right? And so I gotta get rid of all those things and I put my own magnets on there. Yeah. And then once I got the pe person dressed up, ah, oh, that's nice. I started to feel peace again. I started to feel rest again. I started to feel like everything in the universe is right, okay? <laughs> Now, that's how it is with the old man and the new man. The old man is clothed in a life that has moths and moth holes in it, and it's being rusted away, and it's deteriorating, and it's corruptible, and it's subject to sin and death. It's subject to the world. It's subject to what the world says about it. It's subject to what people say about it. It's subject to what people think about it. And I'm telling you, when you think of that life, or when your mind is filled with the life that the world can offer you, you're never going to feel nice. You're going to feel corrupted. You're going to feel tormented. You're going to feel filled with fear. And then your mouth is going to be filled with the poison of ass. What does that mean? That means the doctrine of the serpent. Because if you think your life is corrupted, the only thing that can come out of you is about how you need to fix it. And so your doctrine or the belief in your heart will be one of how you need to clothe yourself with life. That is the poison of the asps, right? That is the doctrine of the devil, right? Mm -hmm. Paul said it this way, I think in, a, in either Ephesians or Colossians, he said that our understanding was darkened because we were alienated from the life of God. Okay, so Adam. Man was not clothed in the life of God. He ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now he's clothed in death. So his understanding became darkened. When he thought of his life, he didn't feel nice. I mean, listen, go walk. We'll take one of us right now, strip us down naked, and lock us outside in the street. Now, one or two of us might, no, who cares? Because <laughs> there's always some strange folks in any group of peculiar people. But most of us are not going to feel nice in that situation, right? And so the understanding that would come upon a person in that situation is, would be, where the hell can I find some clothes? How can I get into a car or into a house? And so our understanding will be darkened with our own works to try to cover our nakedness and to hide our nakedness. So Adam, in the garden, after he ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he's naked. He was alienated from the life of God. It darkened his understanding because when he looked at his life, 
His life was so corrupted, and he saw it perishing. He literally saw it, you could say it this way, he literally saw it returning to the dust of the ground in front of him. He literally saw that it was going back to dust. It's perishing. I'm perishing. I'm dying. And so it didn't feel nice. It doesn't feel nice when you think of your life and you think it's lacking. And you think it's corrupted. And you think that it's dying. And you think that it's going away. And that darkens your understanding. Right? right. Because it tries to tell you about what you need to do to clothe yourself. Now, what's the doctrine of the devil? I will exalt myself unto life by my ability to gather unto myself. Right? Yes. By the good fruit I can bring yes. forth myself, I'm going to exalt myself. That's the poison of Adam. It means for the doctrine of the serpent to be on your tongue. Mm. And it sets your tongue on fire. Right? Go read in James. Yes. It sets your tongue on fire. Right? And you begin lying to your brothers and sisters, just like it says. In Ephesians, in Colossians, lying to your brothers and sisters is not talking about you saying you didn't take $5 when you took $5. It's talking about is what coming out of your mouth to tell people about how they're going to have life by touch not, taste not, and handle not. That's what it means to lie to your brother. It means for you to come and express to them about how they're going to be justified and how they're going to be fruitful and experience the life of God through touch not, taste not, handle not. By the observance of days. Right? That's the poison of that. Yes. And we'll just say it as shocking as you could say it, since money is a big thing for everybody, especially in America. If you come and tell a person that they can be blessed financially by giving 10% at church, that God will bless them if they give 10% at church, meaning he's going to give them more money. That's the poison of Acts. You're lying to your brother because you're telling him about how he's going to attain to the blessing of God by his own words. And Paul come and said that he gave, that God gave all things freely in Christ. He didn't say he stored it up in a house over here, and if you come and give some legal tender, then you can access it. That's not what he said, right? And so if you read the end of Colossians, Paul goes, do not be deceived by vain philosophies, right? And then he goes in, touch not, taste not, handle not. Doesn't that sound like thou shalt not, shalt not? He says it has an appearance of wisdom. <laughs> so what he's saying there is very deceptive. It looks good for food. Most of us think that sounds good. In fact, you've got 90% of the church in America fighting to have the Ten Commandments in, in the White House and in the courtrooms. Because it looks good for food. We think that's the power unto a godly life. That's the poison of Adam. That's not the power unto a godly life. Right? You follow me? So then he, he, he continues to go and he says, it looks wise. It has an appearance of wisdom. Because we all know it's not good to kill, steal, and destroy. And so we look at it and we think, yeah, that's good. But we don't see that it's calling upon our ability to clothe ourselves or bring forth life ourselves. And Paul comes and says something profound, right? After said, it looks like it's wise, but it's of no ability to satisfy the flesh. It, what it means is it's of no ability to put the flesh to rest. It's of no ability to cause lust to be removed from the flesh. Why is it of no ability? Why are we lusting? We're lusting because we think we don't have life. We're lusting because we think we come behind in some good thing we need for life. He says, touch not, taste not, cannot satisfy your flesh because it can't produce the life of God. And that's what you're longing for. So then he goes into what will produce the life of God. He goes into how you do put on the new man. You put on the new man by setting your affection on things above and not on things in the earth. Where? Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So what does it mean to set your affection? It means when you think of your life, when you weigh your life in the balance, when you're judging your life, don't judge your life by the knowledge of good and evil. Don't weigh the good you see in your life and the evil you see in your life and see if you come out on top, but rather find the judgment of the life you have found in the resurrected Christ. We live by the knowledge of the Son of God, not the knowledge of good and evil. And so to live by the knowledge of the Son of God is the way that I judge my life, the metric that I use is I don't consider the deadness I see in my own flesh. I don't consider the deadness I see in the world around me. But I consider the life I see in the resurrected Jesus seated at the right hand of God in a glorified human body. 
And when I see that that's my life, that my life has come from the Father, and I see that's the life he father, he's fathering in me, and I have his incorruptible seed inside of me, that's going to put my flesh to rest. Because my flesh is going to behold what it was always longing for anyway. And once my heart becomes persuaded that I already have all things that pertain to life and God-likeness, that I don't lack anything, my flesh isn't going to think it needs to work to get. My flesh is going to say, I already have. And it's going to be like the spirit of the sun that was manifested in Job. Even should the flesh on my body now rot away, this one thing I know, I will stand before my God in a redeemed, glorified body, in glorified flesh. And so that causes your flesh to rest. You see, what was happening was the devil was trying to tempt Job to work for life. And he had all his friends telling him, oh, you must have sinned. You got some secret sin. How could this happen to you, my man? How Same thing with Jesus. Jesus, you must have some secret sin. How could that happen to you? How could you end up nailed to a tree? Then all of his friends come and tell him what a sinner he is. Then his wife even comes and says, look at you. You got boils all over you. You're, everything's destroyed. Just curse God and die. That's what she tells him. Turn your back on God. Look where he's left you. And then the spirit of the son manifests in Job. Why? His affection was not set on the life he had in the world. His affection was set on his redeemer. This one thing I know, my redeemer liveth. And if he lives, and I know one thing for sure, I'm going to stand before my God in human flesh. Right? He's saying, my body will be redeemed and glorified. Right? Yeah. And you see what happened there with Job. Yeah. And so this is the dynamic that Paul's getting at. Right? And so the way you put on the new man isn't by trying to do good things. If you're trying to put on the new man that way, listen, you're busy living like the old man. Because he, he, remember, Paul said the new man's been created by God in true righteousness and holiness. The old man created his own life by his words. The old man said, Let, look at this great ability I have. I see that it's good to love. I see that it's good to not kill. It's evil to kill and destroy. It's evil to gossip. It's evil to be envious and covetousness. It's evil to, to do all those things. I see it's good to love and to be kind. Let me use my ability to do the good. I'll work the good, and I won't do the evil. And then from that foundation, I'll build myself a life. The prodigal son did that. Right. He tried to build his own life. He created a life for himself, and he created himself in the likeness of sin and death. And where did his ability leave him? In a pig sty, eating pig food. Dwelling with pigs. Where did it leave Adam? Naked and filled with fear and torment and shame. Right? And so God did a work to build a man. And the man God built had the life of God. Okay? Now, when that man sees that the life he has is the life of God, that man starts feeling real nice. That man starts feeling like, I have everything. I mean, I have God. I mean, listen, guys, if you really believed you had God, that you inherited the fullness of God, you would never, ever even be able to think you didn't have something. I mean, how can you say you don't have something if you've inherited God? Right. I mean, I'm just being serious. I mean, we've made small of that. We've made nothing of the fact that we've inherited all that God is and has in itself. That's what it means to be a co-heir. You're not like a half of an heir. You're not like uh, a partial child. You're not like a child from uh, a different mother or something, right? You're a co-heir. You've inherited everything God has in himself. Now, when your heart begins thinking like that, you'll find yourself feeling real nice. You'll find yourself feeling like, I have so much that should someone need something, I find something well up in me where I feel I can give to them. I have so much that even should someone set themselves up as my enemy and curse my name and try to tear down my reputation and try to take life from me, my life is so much that it can't be taken from. I'll even find myself loving them. And I'll even find myself rummaging around in the back to see if there's another coat I can go get to give them. If they smack me on one side of the cheek, I'll find myself giving them the other side of the cheek. Because when I think of my life, all my thoughts are filled with beauty and glory, right? Now, the old man, when he thinks of his life, what do you think his thoughts are filled with? 
I have nothing. I lack. I lack. I lack. What do you think he starts thinking about? How he needs to get. Now, when your life is corrupting in front of your face, you're not worried about other people's lives. And in fact, you'll fight, claw, and push them down to get yourself life. There's a funny sign, though, where George is dating this woman. And uh, the woman's mother caught George eating out of the garbage can <laughs> one day. He was, there was a euclear at the top of the garbage can. There's only one bite in it. And George is busy looking at it. And so he's like, yeah, no one's around. So he grabs it. And the mother walks in right when he eats it. And so she goes and tells the daughter. And the daughter wants to break up with him. Oh, he smooths it out. And so they're back together. But he's at this birthday party with her, her, niece, her niece or her nephew at the, at the apartment in New York. Well, the fire alarm goes off. And George proceeds to knock down all the women and children and <laughs> shove them out of the way so he can get out. <laughs> He's not busy trying to help the women and the children. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? He's busy thinking about his own life. And now his life is going to be burned. And so he's got to get out of there. That's how the old man thinks. And so that leaves the old man stealing, killing, and destroying to try to exalt himself on the life. Cain, when he thought of his life, he weighed it in the balance by the good fruit he could bring forth and the bad fruit he could keep from bringing forth. And that left him in the place where he killed Abel just to try to exalt himself. Murder came out of him because when he thought of his life, he didn't feel that. He saw his life was corrupted, and he saw that it was coming behind, and it didn't feel nice. And so what did he see? Abel has something that I need. Abel's got a good report. Abel's acceptable. If I can exalt myself above Abel, then I can have all that I need. What does he do? He goes and kills Abel, the serpent. What was the serpent's sin? Envy. What was he envious of? He was envious of what man had. And so he thought, if I can exalt myself above man, then I can gain what it is I don't have. When he thought of his life, he thought his life sucked. And that caused him to labor and toil to try to gain or to try to build his own life. He was into life building. The old man is into building his own life. Now, you have a worldly uh, example of that where you have human beings that, you know, they don't even believe in God that are busy trying to build their life in the world. And what I mean by build your life in the world is, you think you're gonna gather unto yourself peace and love and joy, you can gain in the world, right? But then you have most of the church that is busy, life building, busy trying to exalt themselves unto life by quote unquote, the blessing they can get to manifest by the good that they do. Whether it be serving in church, whether it be giving, whether it be some ministry that you have, whether it be whatever. In the praise and worship team, in the hosting team, in the greeters, whatever it might be, they're also busy with life building. It's the same thing. Now, that doesn't mean it's bad to serve, but if you're serving, trying to become or to build yourself a life or to do the right thing instead of just doing it because you have a burning in your bones, then you're busy life building. Yeah. Right? right? And so Paul talked about the old man that was corrupt that his understanding was darkened because the life that he had was dying. It was, he, he didn't have the life of God. So when he looked at his life, he's like, <laughs> what am I going to do? Yeah. And then he starts looking around for what he's going to do. That's the corrupt wisdom. I got to exalt myself. I got to clothe myself. I got to give myself life. That's what Adam did, isn't it? Right? Now that leaves a person lying to their brother, telling them about they can also be exalted if they use the works of their own hand, right? right? Yes. It leaves you stealing, right? It leaves you with corrupt communication coming out of your mouth, right? Because you're busy thinking about how you're gonna attain the life by your ability to bring forth the fruit of God, right? Now the new man has been renewed in the spirit of his mind after the knowledge that dwells in God. So what that means is the new man's mind has been renewed to resting in God for life because he's seen the work that God has done to create a man in true righteousness and holiness, which means God's ability to build a man and to build a man that's clothed in eternal life 
He demonstrated his ability in Jesus, right? Yes. And now, the way you put on the new man is you behold the work of God to build you a life that's incorruptible. It says Jesus reigns through the power of an indestructible life. He's Lord through the power of an indestructible life. That means the death and the sin and the corruption and the decay in the earth can't take his life. Never to be able to die of the sin again. He lords it over the sin and death on our behalf. He's in us and he's Lord over sin and death. He's in us. That means we lord it over sin and death. Right? And so that renews us in the spirit of our mind after the knowledge that God is us. God knows we can't build ourselves a life. He knows we can't clothe ourselves. He's always been of that mind. He come and told Adam, who told you you were naked? Who told you you had to clothe yourself? That's the poison of ass. That hasn't never come from my mouth, Adam. Remember when I got down on one knee and barack you? Remember when I got down on one knee in adoration and I promised you that I would decorate you with my life and I promised you I would decorate your life with the fruit of my life? Remember when I promised you to do it? And then what does God do? Yet once again, let me reaffirm my promise. And he closed them again. <laughs> and now we go to church every Sunday. We're busy hearing about how we got to close ourselves with our good works. So don't you know you're saved by the good work, brother? <laughs> Listen, man. No, no, no. Don't you know you've been saved by the good work of God? That's the proper interpretation of that verse. God did a good work to save you. Now set your eyes on the good work he did, and you'll find yourself being influenced unto rest. And when your flesh goes to rest, guess what will happen? You'll no longer be envying and gossiping and backbiting and murdering and filled with hatred. You'll be filled with something else, love and joy and peace and kindness and meekness, humbleness of mind, long-suffering. The word of grace will be under your mouth. You'll be all the time declaring the glory of God to clothe. You'll be all the time declaring the work of God to conquer sin and death. Instead of showing up and telling, well, brother, you know, you need to do some good works. You don't really know if you're saved unless you're doing those good works, don't you know? Come on, man. That's the poison of ass. You know how long it took Abraham to be justified? He's the father of faith. 17 years. Now, I guess, you know, maybe he needed those brothers and sisters there to ask him if he's really righteous. Oh. Right? I don't know, Abraham, are you really righteous? Where's the promised seed? Yeah, right. You see what I'm saying? We, we're constantly having our minds taken off of the work of God to build the man. God built the man. This man was built by the arm of God, not the arm of man. This man God built possesses the fullness of his life in human flesh. Now, God has come and said, I promise you, I'm going to decorate you with that. Uh, right? And then, like it says, put on means to sink into the garment. When we hear the promise and we behold the work that he did, it causes us to sink into the garment. <laughs> that is the new man. The man that's been created by the arm of God. Right? Instead of thinking about the man we're going to build and create. Right? Right? And that, you know, when you think about how you interpret the scripture, that is how you interpret the scripture. You know, nobody looks at the scriptures and draws any conclusions. You, you're just continually learning things and never coming to knowledge of the truth. Yeah. But there is a truth to be had through the scriptures. Mm -hmm. That's it. So, does everybody understand this? The new man and the old man. The old man is the man that was clothed in death. How many of us want to die? How many of us, if we were strapped down to a bed right now and saw we are about to die, how many of us would feel nice about that? How many of us would be devising a way to get up out of that bed and to get the hell away from that death? Okay, so the old man sees the death that he has. That torments him. It fills him with fear. The author of Hebrews said we were all our days in bondage through the fear of death. In bondage to what? Laboring and toiling, trying to clothe ourselves with the fruit of God's life. Laboring and toiling, trying to bring forth good fruit, trying to keep bad fruit from coming forth, and then clothing ourselves with that. Right? right. That's what we were in bondage to. 
right? Well, Paul would come and say in Romans, you're dead to death. Consider yourself dead to death and alive to the eternal life of God. Because if you start thinking that God's life is your life, in the same way when you think you're dying, it torments you, when you really start thinking that you possess the whole life of God, you start feeling nice. You feel with abundance, right? You actually start walking in this world in light instead of walking in darkness, right? Your understanding becomes animated because understanding can only be born from eternal life. If you are persuaded that you have eternal life, you'll find it even under animating your understanding where you understand all things. You see things like the matrix. For those of you that haven't seen the matrix, there's like a computer program with numbers and characters just going down the screen. Well, one of the guys could look at that and see what it was. It could see people and see things moving around and see what was happening. When eternal life, when you become persuaded of what it means that you've been clothed in the new man, it gives you understanding about all things. You feel nice about your life all the time. You're full of love. You're full of joy. You're full of peace. And I use the example of the soup, right? Mm -hmm. those, of you, those of you that listen to me for a while, you know this about me. My parents especially know it about me. But I had this thing with my clothes, right, where I was a bit, you know, uptight about my clothes and how they looked and what they were and this and that. I mean, like, it would stress me out. Like, I came to uh, home from Colorado from one of my good uh, girlfriend's wedding, and I had to fly with the suit. They wouldn't let me hang that thing. I thought I was going to die on that plane. And so it's just up there, sitting on the top. And I get to Louisiana, and the tail of the suit's all wrinkled and everything. And I'm like, ah! No, I'll just take you to the dry cleaner. I'm like, you know the dry cleaners you got around here? They suck. <laughs> they destroy suits. <laughs> right? So I was tormented by that suit. Right? But, but then there was another suit that I had that was glorious. And I'll post the pictures on the Bible study page so people can see it. But this suit, man, is just glorious, man. And I, I put this suit on and, and you, you feel like a million bucks. And I'm telling you what, man, I felt full of love and peace and joy. I loved everybody at that wedding. I felt like, I felt like a million bucks. I knew I looked better than I actually looked. Yeah. And what's funny is all the other people also felt that way. Right? And so you walk around feeling like you shine like the sun. When you walk around feeling like your life shines like the sun, it feels good. That's what eternal life does inside of a human. Right? And I had another suit. I was going to Tulsa to do a wedding for our, our, our dear friend, Victoria, and her son, Kenneth. Man, what a great wedding. That was so great. She's from Nigeria. Um, and so when he, they were wearing, he was wearing the traditional Nigerian garb. And when they walked in, they walked into the, I don't even know how to describe it, actor, but it was a, a Nigerian entrance for the men into the wedding. It was a sweet, right? But anyway, when I was looking at my suits, to, to put on that wedding, the only dark suit I had, it's a, it was a nice suit. I went and grabbed it and I put it on moth holes in that whole thing. What do you think I felt when I saw moth holes in that suit? Stress, lack, torment. What am I going to do? What do people think of me? Yeah, there you go. What kind of a preacher am I? How can I do this wedding? Oh, my God. You see the thoughts that start coming from fear and torment? You see how it does that? That's the same thing that happens when you think you're clothed in death and you think you're clothed in life. So God knows the answer is in the heart. And he understands that what torments the heart or breaks the heart is for the heart to think that it's separated from life. That's actually what hope not realized makes the heart sick. Now we've turned that into all kinds of nonsense. Like my dream for my life in this world yeah. If it doesn't happen, then my heart will be sick. Listen, man, there ain't no dream for your life in this world that can actually bring forth life in your heart. That's not what that verse says. Hope not realized. What's hope? A certainty that you possess eternal life and that that eternal life is even going to glorify your flesh. Now, when you think you don't have that, your heart will be sick. But when you know that you have that, that eternal life, you have a certainty, like Job, nothing can keep me. And your heart will be comforted. It won't be broken. It'll be comforted. Just like when I put on that nice suit. I was comforted. 
right? I mean, I don't know nobody in Becky's family. It ain't like I grew up in California with them. They don't know me. I'm some strange guy. They're all Catholic. I ain't Catholic. Listen, the first night I met Becky's dad, I did, you guys think I, I struggle with tax now? Listen, I was completely <laughs> tactless then. The first time I met Becky, I mean, her grandma straight off the boat from Italy. She don't even speak. And you know, I get off the board, and there's no one there to meet me. I don't speak no English. I mean, this is how she talks. So these people are like more Catholic than you can. I mean, you think we're Catholic here. No. Nah. No. Nah. The Catholic here looks like non-Catholic compared to their Catholic. So the first day I meet Becky's dad, He's all telling me about this stuff that's going on in his life. And I walk into his room and he's got all these statues of Mary everywhere. I told him about that idolatry. <laughs> now listen. Yeah, exactly. So listen, man, I'm like, you know, I'm already a little bit nervous. I'm a little bit, it's just me. Yeah, right. I got no one of my peeps with me. It's just me. You know what I'm saying? Boy, did I put that suit on. In that nice blue shirt, man, and that, that tie was solid. My eyes are blue. They pop. I'm like, I can, I can conquer the world. I'm, invi I'm invincible. Look at me. It's like you put on the Iron Man suit. There you go. Yes. Right? right. And you're flying around in the Iron Man right. suit. And so I didn't care no more. I can own this room. I can own this situation. I'm dressed in this suit. Right? Yeah. My heart was comforted by the suit that I sunk into because it was so glorious. That's what happens with eternal life. And if your heart sticks, it ain't because you ain't got something from this world. Your heart sits because your eyes have gotten set on the world as if it can give you something. Right. We've grown up in America, and I'm for America. Don't get me wrong. I'm so thankful for America. My grandfather fought in the war. My dad was in the service. I love America. This is not about how I don't like America. But America had us growing up from the time we are in preschool. What's your dream? What are you going to be? And then they've got us setting our eyes on that as if that's the purpose of our life. And if we can attain to the purpose of our life, then we'll feel peace. And then the church come and get it all over again. I'm a mighty man of God. Let me prophesy some ministry over you. you got to find God's purpose. Listen, man, if we're going to church and still thinking we got to find God's purpose, have we even heard the gospel? Because God's purpose is that you live and not die. And so if you have eternal life, that's God's purpose. Right. Right? Yes. And so we've created all these imaginations <laughs> based on the things we can stuck out of the world that we say will clothe us in a real nice suit and that will comfort our heart. The hell it will. Let me say it as radically and boldly as I can so that maybe in offending you, you'll <gasps> <laughs> and you'll think about it. It won't. It can't. It shan't. It doesn't possess the ability to clothe you. The thing that possesses the ability to clothe you is for you to see God's dream for your life. And for you to see that God couldn't deny the dream he had for your life. That he couldn't deny the love he felt in his heart for you. And that when he found you naked and clothed in death or naked in death, he came and clothed upon you with eternal life. That's your purpose. Your purpose is to be loved by God. Your purpose is to live and not die. That's your calling. We've confused passion with calling. Your calling ain't some ministry. Your calling ain't something you can do in the world. Your calling is a high calling. And that's to receive eternal life and for your life to overcome the death in the world. Now, you can be filled with passion. You can be excited about something, and by the power of eternal life, you can be animated with grace, and you can attack that thing like gangbuster. And when the world tries to knock you down, and the world is a stumbling block to you sometimes, and you feel discouraged, you can find that suit that you sunk into, filling you with strength again, and you can find yourself attacking the world again. Because I guarantee you, when Paul's preaching the gospel and he gets stoned to death, there's probably a second where he's thinking, dang. <laughs> I thought when I when I was a kid and I thought I wanted to preach the scriptures, I thought it was gonna go better than this. <laughs> I didn't know I'd be stoned to death and left on the road looking like Rocky Balboa. <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean Paul gets up on the street and he's looking for me. Cut me, Nick. Cut me. I can't see. My eyes are swollen with blood. Cut me. Right? And so we confuse these things. We've 
confused all these things. And then we try to close upon ourselves with our dream, with our purpose, oh, yes. with our calling, yeah. right? We confuse those things. And then that leaves us with a heart that's sick. Because we're all the time trying to be clothed by something that's got moth holes in it. We're all the time trying to be clothed by something that's like the refrigerator in the church. Go back in that back room. Look at that thing. Go yeah. look at that thing. Because the air conditioner's been thrown off the roof. The humidity hangs out there. That refrigerator is rusted over. Yeah, I'll still be here next week. So. <laughs> Listen, we're busy trying to be clothed in that. And we think it looks good for food. Like me. I thought my purpose was to be in the Olympics and to win gold medals and break world records. And I thought if I could do that, that would be the springboard for my ministry. I was trying to be clothed by that every day. Now, what do you think happened in my heart when I couldn't be clothed by that? What do you think happened? My heart was made sick. And then death manifested in my heart. All lack, all fear, all torment. What do you think happened then? I tried to cope with that in my heart. How do you think I tried to do that? Everybody tries to do something different. You know how I tried to do it? Drugs. That's how I tried to do it. Right? And that ended up killing me. I left me in the hospital bed dying. Right? Because my heart was sick. Because I was trying to sink in the suit if it's in the world. But that suit don't fit. Jim Dixon, we were at the men's Bible study. And he said that two weddings ago he did. He hadn't bought a suit in like 25 years. So he put on this suit. And his belly shot. <laughs> he said he sees himself in the pictures and he's just like, oh man. He said the shame he felt. Because it's just tight, you know, it just doesn't look right. He just talked about the shame that he felt. He said, but then he finally went and bought a suit for his next wedding. He said he put that thing on. It was just like, but the world can't clothe you in a suit that will fit or in a suit that doesn't have moth holes in it. It can't clothe you in something that's not rusting away. Right? And I'm just going to say it like it is, guys. And there's no shame for us if we're there. This is what shocks us. If we're there, God's not ashamed of us. Because he sees into our heart and he sees the reason why they're busy with this is because they want life. And they've just gotten deceived into setting their eyes on the wrong life. And so he doesn't feel ashamed of us. Right? So there's no shame for us. But guys, we've made mammon our God. By trying to be clothed in our dreams, and not God's dream for us, our dreams, trying to be clothed in our dreams. Little girls, man, I don't know how it is in other countries, but in America, little girls are raised to think they're going to find their knight in shining armor, and he's going to make them whole. And that's what they're busy trying to be clothed by their whole lives. Listen, man, it's just little boys have other dreams. I'm going to be clothed by that. It leaves you with a sick heart. And it leaves you always laboring and toiling. And it leaves you always judging your life as evil. Because you look at what you say you don't have. And then you come out with the conclusion, my life is evil. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who can save me from this dying body that I'm clothed in? I thank God. Paul said this, right? Paul describes all this at the end of Romans 7. He describes what the old man feels on the inside. He says the old man sees what's good, but his flesh, in his flesh dwells sin and death. And the more he tries to engage dying flesh to try to bring forth life, what happens? More death. More death. And then he sees, I have an inability to clothe myself with light. And I have an inability to deliver myself from this body of death. Torment. Right? And then he sees, but God has come in Christ Jesus. And he's condemned this death that was manifesting in my flesh in the body of Jesus' resurrection. He, God made a man. Adam made a man. And the man Adam made was made in the image of sin and death, the likeness of sin and death, full of corruption, full of labor and toils, full of fear, full of torment. But then Paul sees that God saved him from that because God came and made a man. And God condemned sin in the flesh of the man he made. And he clothed this man in a flesh that can never die again, that is not subject to sin and death ever again. And then Paul saw the death that I was clothed in has been condemned by God. And now he's got a suit for me that can never have moth holes in it ever again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so now Paul says, even when I'm floating in the ocean, 
What do you think the world's trying to tell me about my life when I'm shipwrecked and floating in the ocean? It's trying to tell me how I'm separated from life. But I remember how God condemned death in the flesh of Jesus. And I remember how he clothed upon me with the spirit of his life. And now even my heart is wrapped in light and life. And I see that I have a certainty that even my body will be redeemed from the death in this world. My life has already overcome the world in Christ. I've already overcome this shipwreck. <laughs> That's what, nothing can separate me from the love of God. Now listen, back to what I said at the beginning. The love of God Paul's talking about there is not just God loves me. He's talking about all of the fruit of the Spirit. The death in this world can no longer subvert my soul and take me from peace. Even should I feel sorrow for a moment, that sorrow is not unto despair. Even should I feel grief for a moment, that grief does not turn into despair, but it's renewed unto joy. And so he's saying, the death in this world can no longer take me from peace. It can no longer take me from joy. It can no longer steal my patience, my meekness. It can no longer take those things from me, right? Yeah, right. And then he goes into, how can those things condemn me? It's Christ that has condemned death. <laughs> if Christ has condemned death, then how can death tell me that I'm separated from life? It can't. It used to, but now it can't. Oh, hallelujah. Right? Yes. And that's when in Ephesians it would get into um, be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. It's not talking about being angry like, like we think of angry. Or wrath, like we think of anger. It's talking about the excitement in a person's soul. It's talking about the agitation in a person's soul that comes upon them when they think they're separated from life. So Paul is saying, don't let that excitement in your mind, that excitement in your soul, that agitation that can come when you see death, don't let it take your members captive and cause you to think that you need to give yourself life. Yeah, right. Oh, man. <laughs> it's the same thing that it says in James, where it says, the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. It's not talking about the anger of man. Remember, it just finished talking about count it all joy when you experience various trials and tribulations. It's saying trials and tribulations try to subvert your soul. They try to agitate your soul and excite your mind into thinking you have to work for life. And so Paul is saying, listen, your passion to give yourself life can't give you life. So don't be confused about that. Because if you think that you can give yourself life, lust will be born in you. And when that lust is conceived, sin will be born in you. Paul's getting into the same kind of thing in Ephesians 4 at the end of Ephesians 4. That's what he's talking about. He's not talking about, well, husbands and wives, you know, it's not good to go to bed still mad at each other. It may be true that it's not good to go to bed mad at each other. But that's just not what he's saying there. Do you see what I'm saying? It may be good not to go to, mad, go to bed mad at each other, but that's not what he's talking about, right? Yes. He's talking about the excitement, and we've all felt it. We've all felt the temptation to clothe ourselves when we think we're coming behind in some good thing. He's saying, don't let that excitement you feel inside of yourself to try to gain life, to fix, to have, to exalt. Don't let that be born inside of you, of you and you trying to work with your hand to clothe yourself, right? Right? Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Amen. Right? Oh, yeah. you, you said something about that it can't take my patience from me. It can't take my meekness from me. And I'm, I'm, I'm like, in the moment, I'm not patient. In the moment, I'm, I'm not meek. I mean, it's like, that, that just turned me on my head to think, no, I. I have patience. I have meekness. You have life. I have life. No matter what stress you right. feel without, you still have life in you. Yeah. Right? right? And so the only way it could take patience and meekness and peace from you is if it could take life from you. Right. Well, it can't come and take the incorruptible seed out of you. Amen. It can't. It cannot. Right? So if you feel stress, and you feel like patience isn't manifesting, that's not to think that you're separated from patience. Right. That just means that the world has come and tried to fit you in its suit. And you're looking at it, and you're thinking there's moth holes in it, man. <laughs> How can I perform good dentistry like this? 
right? And so all you need to do is have your mind or your affection right. step back on the life of God or the incorruptible seed of God that dwells inside of you, and that seed will start preserving your heart or keeping your heart from lust, right? It'll put your flesh to rest. Right? right? That's why Paul said, it's of no power to the satisfying of the flesh. Then he goes into, but do you know what is power to cause your flesh to go to rest? Setting your affection on the resurrected Jesus and saying, his life is my life. Right? right? Which is what Abraham did. Abraham didn't consider the deadness he saw in his flesh or in Sarah's body or Sarah's womb, but he considered the life of God. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's what Paul said about it. Right. You guys see all that dynamic? With all of that, you see what I'm talking about? Yeah, Beula, we we're testing Beulah's patience tonight. <laughs> Beulah, go ahead. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, you know, all that you were talking about, I lived that way for so many years, um, trying to clothe myself, trying to put on the new man. And... Um, that is all so, so foreign to me because I see Jesus. And, um, you know, in your message, you said, um, I might not get it exactly right. But you said something to the effect, God's ability is more than sufficient to create you in his likeness and image. He don't need your help. He don't need you to pick up a hammer and hammer in some nails or pick up a saw and saw some wood is all he needs is for you to lay down your hammer. And when you said that is all I could think of. Now remember the Old Testament is shadows and types of that which would be fulfilled in Christ. And when they were building the temple in First Kings, it says the house, when it was in building, was built of stone, made ready before it was brought thither, so that there was neither hammer nor axe nor any tool of iron heard in the house while it was in building. When that temple was being built, it was being built of stones, that had already been cut exactly to fit while it was in the quarry. There was to be no sound of any uh, uh, tool at the temple site because that would be to reflect man's labor. Yeah. And you know, the scripture says that you've forgotten, you've forgotten the rock that begot you. And remember in, in Matthew 16, 18, when Jesus said, who do men say that I am? And Peter says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus turned around to Peter and he said, thou shalt be called Peter, a piece of the rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church. Upon this revelation, I will build my church. Christ is building the church. We're not building the church. Yep. He says, and upon this revelation, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The gates of hell is hadas, which is not to see. Now, sin blinded us to see what God saw in us. We came from God. We were children of God. We were hewn from the same rock that Jesus was. But we couldn't see who we was and we couldn't see who God was. And you know, the scripture says in Isaiah 50, 52, 14, that Jesus's visage, his face was so badly marred that he was unrecognizable. That's what sin did to man. Sin made man his visage so marred that he didn't look anything like God. But Jesus came to die that away. And until I realized, I used to think, I used to say it and, and heard it, you know, we die daily. We've got to crucify our flesh daily. No, that's all works. Jesus, I died. I died when Jesus died. Yeah. 
because in Adam, the whole human race was brought into slavery to sin. Yep. And in Christ, he took the whole human race into his body and he died it away, freeing us, taking, out of, taking us out of captivity to sin. Now, the thing is, the prison door is open, but until we see, until the Holy Spirit causes us to see and gives us the eyes of faith to behold what Christ has done, there we sit in our cage, thinking that we're in bondage to sin. But you know, the scripture says, Paul says, he says, Jesus died unto sin once and is alive unto God forevermore. Likewise, in the same manner, reckon yourselves indeed dead to sin. Now, what people have got to understand is you are not in bondage to sin. Jesus Christ has set you free from sin and he raised you up in a brand new platform of justification. You're justified before God. He's not holding anything against you. Now, let's get a reality of that truth. And when we see that we are truly dead to sin, not by anything we did, Jesus did it for us. He killed the, the, uh, the, the sin that we were bound to in Adam, and he's joined us to himself. And so now he's raised us up in him. Now, where the universalists get it wrong is they think that when we were raised up in newness of life to be able to apprehend that life by faith, they think that we've got his spirit. But the thing is, Paul says, Paul says, if you have not the spirit of Christ, you're none of his. Oh, well, who's that? That's the person that was raised up in Christ to a brand new opportunity, but has not received Christ. You know, yeah. you can be in God, but God's got to be in you. And Jesus yeah. said, in that day, you will know that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, and I in you. That's the day the Holy Ghost opens your eyes to see what you need. You receive the living Christ, and let him just blow the doors open in your life. <laughs> and, and real, real quick, if, if, if you can know, keep going in a second. Does everybody understand what it means to be set free from sin? Because we, we don't really know what sin is. And so then we, we right. miss it. And so I, I try to use this language. You're set free from death. Yes. Sin takes you captive through death. Right. If death is moved out of the way, sin has lost its power. Right? So that's how you're taken captive. So when you think of sin, think of death like simultaneously. The wages of sin is death. Right? So if you like to read the Bible and you read Paul talking about wrecking yourself dead to sin, and you think that means wrecking yourself to no longer do any bad behavior, or you got to try and stop doing bad behavior, you're misreading the scripture. To wrecking yourself dead to sin means to wrecking yourself dead to death. You've been divorced from death, right? You've been divorced. Paul said it this way. I was crucified with Christ to the world in the world to me. So my life is no longer made up of the world and the things of the world. My life is made up of the life of God, right? And so that's how you would reckon yourself dead to sin. Not by trying to clean up your act, but I've seen I'm dead to death. The, the life that I have in this world, that's not my life. Right. Yeah. I'm, so, dead, I'm dead to the life of me trying to clothe myself. Yeah. That's what I'm dead to. Yeah. You know, <laughs> because, you know, Jesus opened my eyes and showed me that you can't have life except you receive it from me. So right. that's all a dead end street. Now, look at this scripture in light of, of us being uh, caught in the quarry. OK, uh, there's a couple of scriptures that come to my mind. But one is in First Peter, chapter two. It says, um, if you have tasted that the Lord is gracious to whom coming as unto a living stone. We're coming to a living stone, which is Jesus. 
disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. He was the chief cornerstone, okay? And then it says, and these uh, translators uh, just couldn't bring it, bring themselves to translate the same word as the living stone. He called us lively stones, but it's the exact same word. So really it should say, you also are living stones are built up a spiritual house. See, we're being built up. We're not doing it. This is God doing it, okay? A holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable unto God by Jesus Christ. And when I was reading that, it brought me in my mind to Ephesians 4, where it talks about um, the, the, uh, the gift, the um, teaching, you know, uh, apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry. And it says that we all may be fitly joined together. Now, just, just let that soak in. Fitly joined together. We have been cut in the quarry to be able to fit perfectly together. And, and, and between those joints, it's filled with love. Amen. That, that, that love stops any friction, you know? Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I just wanted to say something, Greg. You know, you were saying, you know, eternal life uh, produces, you know, love, peace, and all this. But I cannot, in my mind, you correct me if I'm wrong. I cannot separate love from eternal life because God is no more. Can I separate God from light? God is light. God is love. God is life. And, and love is not something that God possesses. It's something he is. He can't yeah. change who he is. Yeah, but when it says God, when it says God is love, it's not talking about the Father is love. It's talking yeah. about life in the God. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. So what I'm saying is, to live in eternal life is to live in love. Yes, the fruit of eternal life is love. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the fruit of the Spirit from the Spirit of life. Yes. Right. right? So love and eternal life are one and the same. Absolutely. Right? Same with peace and kindness and, yeah. and all of that, right? Yeah. There was, come back to, to Abraham again, because that, that's another one where, where people will, be, will dwell on the whole thing of, oh, well, you know, Abraham put on the man, you know, of faith. Like, like, like he did the work to become you what know, work did he do to become? Well, that's what, well, that's what I'm, where I'm going. It's like, you know, he finally accepted, uh, you know, God's hand on him that he would, you know, raise raise his son, you know, like from 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 death if he uh, slew him on the altar. But there were so many things all along in Abraham's life where, even after he was declared, you know, you will be the father of many nations. He saw him screw up, screw up. It's, I mean, you know, he didn't listen to his wife, and then his wife, you know, got all upset with, oh, no. <laughs> you know, he wouldn't bother in Ishmael. But even I, before that, though, Abraham was basically telling Sarah lies. I mean, lies right. to the, the Babylonian king. You right. could go be in right. there because right. he was afraid. Exactly. He was living a life. And he didn't, he didn't understand. So you, right. right when God told Abraham, when God promised Abraham, and Abraham didn't understand how it was going to come forth. So then he tried to bring it forth. Yeah, and then you have that. where God comes and says, I am the all-sufficient one. El Shaddai. So that's when God revealed to Abraham that his ability to appear as the father of many nations were not by his strength, but it was by the strength of God. That's when he changed Abraham's name from Abram to Abraham, and he added the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which is grace, right? 
And so Abraham saw that God said to be the father of many nations, but then he thought it was going to be by his strength. And so then he had an Ishmael with Sarah, right? Because he didn't understand how it was going to be. Right. How's it going to be, right? My, my wife, I mean, how are we going to have any children? But then God revealed himself as El Shaddai, the all-sufficient one. I am your sufficiency, right? That was God revealing the faith to Abraham. Abraham saw that, and he was persuaded, right? right. So then from that day forward, Abraham didn't just fear God. But Abraham was fully persuaded, right? Then Abraham had something in his heart where he said that, I'm not going to be the father of many nations by my ability to preserve Isaac. My, 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 my ability to keep Isaac alive. Right? right? He saw that be by God's ability. Right? So then right. God knew that was in Abraham's heart. Right. So then God said, well, let's prove Abraham. Let's show everybody right. what's in Abraham's heart. Right? What was in Abraham's heart? God will provide himself a lamb. Right? <laughs> right? Yeah. That's what he thought. Right. God will preserve us. Did God preserve the promised seed? Yeah, because it wasn't Isaac, it was Jesus. Well, what do you do with Jesus? Raise him from the grave and set him at the right hand, never to die again. Right? right. But, but before we get off of anything, I want to give people a chance to, to ask about the new man right. and the old man. Yeah. And, and even, and I just want to explain to people in my, grace, in my walk in grace, there was a time where my mind was set on not living by the works of my own hands. I saw that that was corrupt. I saw it was the poison of ash. But then, even though I saw it was the poison of ash, I, I found myself in a period of time where I was trying not to live by the works of my own hand. I was trying to live by the truth, even from the carnal mind. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? And that was still much better than where I was before. And I was experiencing more life then, right? But I was still trying to bring forth rest, so to speak, right? What I've, what I've seen happen now is in beholding the death of death, in beholding what it means that I'm dead to death, I find that that has cleansed me from working. So it wasn't that I see I need to not work and then I didn't work. It's that I saw it's not by my works and then I started seeing the work of God. And as I saw the work of God, to separate me from death and join me to his eternal life, that started putting me to rest, and it cleansed me from the carnal mind. Because death is the father of the carnal mind. It's the father of a mind that thinks it must work. And so, really, the and I, one of the best messages I ever preached, I don't know if anybody listens to this message anymore, it's one of the best messages that ever come out of me. It's called Salvation from Unbelief. That is one of the most profound messages I ever preached. I go back and listen to that all the time. It's one of the only messages of mine I'll, I'll even listen to. But that thing is profound because that's when I started getting my head wrapped around the fact that God will actually cleanse me from even being able to have a carnal thought. He'll cleanse my mind from the thought of working. And the way that he does it is by showing me that death has been conquered, right? That I'm crucified to the death that's in the world. And then if you see yourself as divorced from death, your brain can't think of working. Do you see what I'm saying? It can't contemplate working. It doesn't go there. Death has to bother that. And if you see that death has been conquered and you're divorced from it, then it, death doesn't have any ability to give birth to labor and toiling in you. So it's not like you're trying to live by your intellectual understanding that you can't have life by the works of your own hands. It's that as you behold the death of death, and you behold your union to God and his eternal life, that cleanses you from thoughts of working to attain to life, right? And it causes you to see things. Because there was a lot of times where I was like, I knew that it was sin to try to have life by the works of my own hand. So I would purposely not do things, just to be sure I'm not in sin, right? It was like I was trying to not do things that maybe I think I really wanted to do, but I don't want to be doing it to try to have life. Do you see what I'm saying? And so once I started seeing this dynamic, and everybody go back and listen, salvation from unbelief. It is, it is a profound message. God will cleanse you from a mind that's filled with works by showing you the death of death. Because we were all our days in bondage through the fear of death. Bondage to what? Laboring and toiling. What were the Hebrews in bondage to? 
making bricks. What were they trying to make bricks with? They didn't even have straw and mud. What were the bricks for? Building a temple, building a life, right? And so if we can have our conscience cleansed from death, we'll find our thoughts no longer filled with works at all, right? And so it's like, if we can behold the death of death, that will purge us from thoughts of working. We will purge us from lack. You can't have a thought of working unless you're filled with lack. And so God will even purge you from the lack, from the common mind, just by you beholding the depth of death. That's why I'm making such a big point, the language that I'm using, right? We're like off in the nitty gritty now. When I first got in the grace, I, I thought, well, I just got to be persuaded that God's not judging me for my bad behavior. That's a nice thing to see that. That's not the power of the gospel. It's a nice thing to see that. It gets you close enough to God that you, you, you know he's not going to judge you. It gets you close enough to hear what he's really trying to tell you. I, I think I've used this example before. But it's like I was out in the backyard, you know, outside. He was calling me into the bedroom, and I would, he had something to tell me, and I wouldn't come in there, right? But then he's like, oh, I'm not judging you for your bad behavior. Oh, he's not judging me for my bad behavior. Then I come a little bit closer, now I'm in the back patio, right? <laughs> then, he, then I start hearing, oh, I'm beautiful to him. Oh, he's not, not only is he not judging me for, but he's never confused me with what I've done. I'm beautiful. I've always been beautiful. Always got down on one knee. Next thing I know, I was back in the bedroom with him face to face. And then he's like, okay, I've had something to tell you. Let me tell you now what it is. And now he started telling me. Now I started seeing what was the real problem. Death. I started seeing what death was doing to me. I started seeing what it does to the human heart. I started seeing how it manifests itself in our flesh. I started seeing the answer to purge from death is what God did in the resurrection to destroy death in the flesh, sin and death in the flesh. I saw that having my conscience purged from sin is not about having my conscience purged from my bad behavior. That's like a small little branch of the tree. To have your conscience purged from sin means to have your conscience purged from death. And if your conscience is purged from death, that's going to cause you to enter into God's rest, right? That's going to put your flesh to rest if your conscience can be purged from death. So you behold the blood that run out of Jesus' flesh. Blood is the power behind corruptible flesh. Right. And so when you see the blood run out of Jesus' flesh, you're beholding the death of corruptible flesh. And when you see him raised up in a flesh and bone body without blood anymore, you see that his has a body that's animated by the power of the Holy Spirit in incorruptible flesh. Right. And you start beholding that flesh as the promise, right? that God promised you. And you see that he didn't just promise you something. You see he can do what he promised. And he's given you the down payment of it, right? It's like my little sister was thinking about buying a house. You have to put down, a, uh, what is it, an escrow or something? Yeah. A down payment to tell the people you're going to buy the house. Right. So God has given me the down payment. I have the Holy Spirit in me, the spirit of life, right. the spirit that animates incorruptible flesh. Mm -hmm. And I see that's what it's going to do inside of me. And as I behold that, my conscience is purged from sin. It's purged from death. And if my conscience is purged from death, no one can convince me I have to work for life. Yes. That's what I tried to say. What James talked about no longer being tossed to and fro with any, every wind of doctrine. If all of us were really persuaded of what it meant that we had eternal life, ain't nobody could have confused us with some tithing that. Ain't nobody could have come and confused us that we can get blessing and money from God by giving money. Because the eternal life would have said inside us, you have all things. What is that going to get? If that doesn't make sense. How am I going to work? For what do you mean I'm going to work to get money? I have eternal life. What kind of nonsense is that? Right? And so that, it purges your conscience from the carnal mind. You know, and I, all the time, man, all the time, about the church, I've made my heart grieves for the church and feel so much love for the church. But we're all the time talking about we have the mind of Christ and then we preach the mind of Adam. Listen, man. We can have the mind of Christ, and if we're always fellowshipping with the mind of Adam, we're going to experience the life of Adam. That's what's going to happen. And so we can't now come and say we have the mind of Christ, and in the next breath, say God forsook Jesus at the cross, because that's the mind of Adam. We can't in one breath say we have the mind of Christ and say, but we got to clothe upon ourselves with these good words. we got to give money to get money. No, it, it doesn't work that way. Does everybody see that? That's why I've been... That's why I preach the same message every week. <laughs> That's why I preach the same message in every Bible study. And I wrestled with God about this. But God was like, well, Greg, if you love the people, you'll preach what they need, not what they think they need. 
He said, I know you feel uncomfortable because my whole life I was raised to think that I make people feel pain. And so if I think the people are experiencing discomfort because of me, it actually torments me, right? And so, man, God had to work inside of me. The thing that is everybody's problem is the effect of death. Any area of your life that you think is being ailed by something, it's because you're still viewing your life through the old man in some area. And the thing that's going to save you is to see death nailed to a tree. And for you to see death is dead, and you've been divorced from it, and that God's life is your life. That's the thing that everybody needs. That's it, period. You don't need to hear about some wisdom so you can have a good natural life. You don't, need to, you don't need to hear that. The best natural life you can have in this world is for your heart to be filled with love and joy and peace and kindness and make meekness and patience. It'll cause you to walk in this world in a very wise way. A wise man, a man filled with the peace and the love and the joy and the patience of God will see things through the eyes of wisdom. Everything they do will be born from understanding and wisdom, right? And so that's all that we need is to see how death has been nailed to a tree and to see how God has braided us together with his eternal life. And for us to hammer that from every which direction we can hammer. Right? And for us to pull it out of every single verse and every single scripture that we can, because that's what it's all talking about. And I love what Beulah said about the temple. That's very interesting. And it's a type and a shadow of God building the temple, a body, right? And if you notice in Moses, when Moses has the altar, right after he gets the, uh, the law from Mount Sinai, it says not to make the altar with tools, right? The works of man's hand, right? When he goes up into the mountains to get the commandments, he, Moses, take off your shoes. This is holy ground. His shoes were made by the works of man's hand, right? And he was standing on grace ground. He was actually standing on sapphire stone. When he came down with the law, it was written on sapphire stone. God was saying, you're standing on ground that's set apart unto grace. And those shoes have been made by the works of man's hand. Take them off. Right? And all these things are, are types and shadows. But it's like, I promise you, man, death is the problem. That tor that's what torments you in every area. It's you know, life. You know, it's interesting. It's, uh, uh, it's that the Bible says that from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, death was in the world. Mm -hmm. But... The law was not in the world. So the truth is, nobody from the time of Adam to the time of Moses broke a commandment. Yep. Because there was no commandment. Right. right. So it would testify to the reality that death is the problem. <laughs> is that we didn't need a commandment to break to be dead. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Death is the problem. It was before Adam, before Moses, and it's the problem after Moses. Right. Yeah, and, and it, Paul goes on to say that there's without the law, there's no transgression. That's right. And yet people were still dying. So there wasn't transgression, and everyone was still dying. And listen, I love listen. I love all my brothers and sisters in every faction. I even love my enemies now. Glory to God. <laughs> but man, the grace, so much of the grace people have come out of Egypt, and now they're busy thinking the law is the problem. And now every Sunday, all they're talking about is the law. As if the law is the enemy of man. The law is not the enemy of man. It didn't kill people. That's not what the law did. The law revealed what killed people. The law is not what condemned people. The law revealed what condemned people. And now we show up every Sunday and want to talk about how the law is the one causing the problem. And so now everybody, every Sunday, in the great circle, coming in and shadow boxing, fighting the law. You know what's being born inside of those people? Rebellion. Rebellion against the law. Instead of talking about how death was nailed to the tree. And it's, man, I, I, my heart breaks for the church. I tell God all the time, Lord, how long will all the people suffer? Can you, like, touch my mouth so I can talk eloquently and people might believe what I say then? Can you make me slightly more poetic? <laughs> so they'll, I'll, I'll tri they'll be tricked long enough to listen. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, yeah, yeah. And it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart. It's like, I gotta be honest, man. Sometimes I feel like, what's the point, Lord? I'll stop saying it. No one's listening. Oh, we, wanna, we wanna show up every Sunday and hear about how the law is a problem. How can we say the law is a problem, man? How can we say that what is a shadow of Christ 
is what was killing us. Oh, if it's the God. shadow of Christ, then how can it say something different than Christ? If it's the shadow of good things to come, then how can it be the evil? Paul, man, Paul says it so plainly. The carnal mind is enmity against God, not the law. It says the carnal mind is what was killing us, not the law. The law revealed the carnal mind for what it was. So let me rather be happy that the law come and reveal that sin is exceedingly sinful, Paul said. Paul even, Paul even knew that people were going to misunderstand what he was saying about the law could be hammered for so many chapters. And what was he hammering? That you can't have life by performing the works of the law. That's what he was hammering and hammering and hammering. He says, well, lest you be confused, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? No. Okay. God forbid, he says, that we would ever say that. Well, sin is what brings death. And so if we say the law is what brings death, we're calling the law sin. If we say it's the law that brought condemnation, we're calling the law sin. Paul said, God forbid, let us never say that, for I had not known sin except the law revealed. Covet thou shalt not covet. What? Coveting what? Life. And so Paul said the law revealed that sin was exceedingly sinful. That's, a, that's like a tongue twister. The law revealed that trying to attain the life by the works of your own hands will leave you missing the mark of eternal life. That's what the law revealed. Now, is that good to know? Yes. Is it good to know that we were trusting in the works of our own hands and that was causing us to miss God's dream for our life? Isn't that good for us to know? Doesn't that help save us? Okay, right? And it's like, my goodness, man. Can we just see what the enemy is? I mean, what do you do when the scripture says every good and perfect thing comes from God? Because the law came from God. Yeah, right? we know that. It can't, can't, can't be killing you. It can't, can't be bad. bad. It can't, can't be bad. bad if it came from God. Yeah. The carnal mind looked at the law yeah. and didn't see the work of God. Right. The carnal mind is filled with the work it must do. Yeah. And so when it beholds the law, it doesn't behold the work of God. It beholds the work it can do. Mm -hmm. Right? Steve, I love what Stephen says in that whole dissertation. I brought it out in the Bible study. This will mess people up to think the law is what kills people. Stephen, talking about what God gave Moses on Mount Sinai, called it the lively oracles. You know what that word lively is? Zoe. The zoe utterances of God. That means a word that is full of life. Not death. Not lack. Not killing. That's what Stephen said about the law. Because Stephen saw what the law was pointing to. Right? And now he sees that Christ has brought to realization what that law was always talking about. That law was always talking about the work of God. That law was always God promising man, I will offer myself as a lamb to remove the sin of the world. And I will raise you up unto eternal life by my strength. That's what the law was always promising. Now Jesus came as the manifestation of what that law was always promising. Now we see the work of God finished and complete, right? right. But the law was never the problem. It's the carnal mind. You guys have seen me do it a million times. I explain Christ and the law nonstop. Right. If we really want the legalistic church to stop trying to live by the works of the law, it's not going to be by us telling them that the law is what's killing us. It's going to be by us revealing that that law is talking about Jesus. Yes. That's how it's going to happen. Yeah. Right? And the sooner we can get busy with that, we might find all the legalistic people that frustrate the grace people, we might find them starting to consider it. Because it doesn't make sense to them when you tell them the laws with killing people. Right. That doesn't make sense. Right. They get confused. Right? It only made, yeah, listen, it, that's not what caused me to go to grace. You know what caused me to go to grace? I saw that I was completely unable to give myself life. And so even in my confusion, I was a broken person. And so it was either I'm going to have life as a free gift or I'm just going to die. You know what I'm saying? There was no other option. Right. And that's why I believed in the grace, even despite my confusion. Yeah. Right? Uh, yeah, I can read this good in the chat. It's been going on. Lisa wrote, the perfect law of lively oracles mirror the truth raging around in the carnal mind. The mark missing, distracted carnal mind. 
Now listen, if I could talk like Lisa. <laughs> Seriously, I know. I get. I need to get Lisa to be like my interpreter. Your interpreter, right? Exactly. <laughs> I know. Because she, so nice. she, she put these magical words on what I see in my heart, right? And man, it's like that's not. <laughs> if only Lisa, if we ever run into to each other in person, maybe you can lay hands on me. Yeah. <laughs> you can impart that that that, that gift to me. <laughs> Oh, oh God. God. All Greg. right, Greg. God told me a long time ago he touched your mouth, brother. <laughs> <laughs> oh, amen. All right, gang. It's already after 8 o'clock, so I think we're going to wrap things up. Yeah. You guys are awesome. Thank you so yeah, much for letting me yeah, in. Good. Another you. green. Pop off. We popped good. off tonight. Yeah. Love y'all. Thank you guys. See you next week. Bye. 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 See y'all.